We want to welcome all who are gathering with us by way of live stream. Uh, welcome to those who are members of our congregation. Though I cannot see you and you can see me as I look at the empty benches here, I can almost imagine your faces here because you oftentimes sit in the same places. But also a warm welcome to those who are visiting with us, those who are not members of Emmanuel United Reformed Church here in DeMott. We welcome you as you join us for worship this evening as we use this opportunity to focus our attention on God, to feed our souls, to grow in faith, but also to give him the glory that he deserves. We think of worship as a conversation in which God speaks to us and we respond to him. God begins this conversation by speaking to us in his word, and he says this to us in Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has openly shown in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And whoever the psalm writer was who spoke these things, undoubtedly he might have been thinking about the way in which the whole world had become aware of the great salvation when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. There were other great battles along the way in which it became very well known to the world around them that God had been involved in delivering the Israelites. But as we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, has not the entire world, in a sense, become aware? Not that everybody in the world knows about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, in our day, it seems that even in our own nation, there's a decreasing number of those who know about the resurrection of Jesus Christ or even about the Bible. But it is true that around the globe, there are those who know that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Whether they acknowledge it, whether they honor it, that's another question. But the fact that it has gone out, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, is indeed true. And in that sense, we can say the, the world has seen the salvation of our God. With that in mind, let us joyfully come before our God in prayer as we begin our service tonight. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the grace that you have shown in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we are grateful to you for your sacrifice on the cross, but we also honor you as the Lord who has overcome death. And we thank you, O God, that you continue to make yourself known to us, not simply by your word, but through the ministry of your spirit. And so tonight we pray that we might come to know you as our God and Father. And may we know you through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And may that be brought home to us by the powerful working of your Holy Spirit. It is in the name of our Savior we pray this. Amen. As we join in worship tonight, we make a confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Really, a very powerful testimony. If you think about it, during these times, we are separated from one another, and yet there is one thing that unites us, and that one thing is our relationship to God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is what unifies us. But it not only unifies us in our times, but it connects us with the church of all ages. What were Christians saying 500 years ago? What about 1,000 years ago? What about 1,500 years ago? 2,000 years ago, they were saying the very same thing. They believe in one God, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the foundation, that is the outline for the Christian faith even today. And so we unite our hearts with the church of all ages and with one another now by making this confession. And I ask you tonight, Christian, what do you believe? And we say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me just clarify one line in that confession. If you're not familiar with it, if you're visiting with us, we say, I believe the Holy Catholic Church. By Catholic, we do not mean the Roman Catholic Church, but the word Catholic itself simply means universal. We believe in a universal church, a church that goes into every land, a church that calls people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, a church that not only exists in our time, but exists in all times. That's what we mean by Catholic. It is universal. It transcends all times, peoples, nations, languages. And so what a great confession we have. Tonight we are going to come before God in a moment of prayer. Last time I led the service, we used a psalm to guide us in our prayer. I'm going to do the same thing again tonight. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Pastor Rossi had mentioned Psalm 22 this morning and the proclamation of the word. Psalm 22 begins with a very familiar phrase. It begins by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the next 21 verses describe with great accuracy the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It even speaks about his hands and his feet being pierced. But then at verse 21, there is a shift. At verse 21, it says, save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And then this line. You have answered me. How did God the Father answer the prayer of Jesus Christ? Not by keeping him from death, but by raising him from the dead on the third day. And then Pastor Rossi had mentioned verse 22, where Jesus says, I will declare your name to my brethren. And as he explained this morning, that means that Jesus, in his death and resurrection, came to see and to explain and pronounce that his disciples were like brothers to him. And what the writer of the New Testament says, based on this verse, believers like you and me are considered by God himself to be brothers and sisters to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to use the tail end of this psalm to guide us in our prayer tonight. So if you want to keep your eyes open and keep your eyes on the scripture, I'm going to begin in verse 22. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can call you Father because of what we read here in Psalm 22, verse 22, where Jesus identifies us as his brothers and sisters. And that he views himself as being in the midst of our congregation. We think of him, Heavenly Father, as our song leader who praises you and leads us in that praise. O oh Lord God, verse 23, may we fear you and in our fear of you not be scared of you, but have awe and reverence so that we praise you. May we consider ourselves to be like the descendants of Jacob and therefore glorify you just as you delivered the people of Israel from Egypt. May we also acknowledge that you are the God who delivers us from sin and from the tyranny of the devil. And therefore, O oh God, may we fear you as those who stand in solidarity with the Old Testament church with the New Testament church in the days of the apostles and also of the church today. O oh Lord God, we thank you in verse 24 that Jesus Christ did not despise or abhor the afflicted one. We thank you that you did not abhor Jesus when he was afflicted so that we might know that you did not abhor us 
when we are going through hard times. And just as you did not hide your face from Jesus, may we know that you do not hide your face from us. For when Jesus cried out to you, though you did not deliver him from death itself, you did raise him on the third day. May we be assured that when we cry out to you, you are a God who hears us, though we cannot see you, though we cannot touch you with our hands. May we know, Lord God, that in heaven you hear our prayers through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we say with the psalmist in verse 25, may our praise be to you, even in the congregation. And though we are separated from one another, as we sing, even in our own homes, in the privacy of our own living rooms, may it be that you would hear our prayers. And may we pay our vows before you, before those who fear you. May we sense that we are part of a greater body. And may we know, Heavenly Father, verse 26, that in you, even the poor shall eat and be satisfied. And those who seek you will praise you. And so, O oh God, may our heart live forever. And may we rejoice in you forever. Verse 27, may we delight that all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. O oh Lord God, we hear reports of how the gospel has gone forth into many nations and the way in which the word has been translated and is being translated and many are hearing the gospel for the first time. We are grateful to know, Heavenly Father, that there are those on the other side of the earth who are already waking up to Monday morning, having been at worship on the Lord's day. And may we see and recognize that all of this is a result of your son, Jesus Christ, rising from the dead. O oh Lord God, in verse 28, may we confess that your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and that Jesus Christ rules over the nations. And before he ascended into heaven, we remember how he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And we have seen the fruit of that profession and that prophetic announcement. O Lord God, verse 29, all the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before you even those who cannot keep themselves alive. And certainly, dear God, in these days, there have been those who have died, some because of, as a result of the virus that has spread, others because of other means by which they have met death. But we also know, dear God, that many of them, having been believers, died in hope, not in despair. May you, dear God, comfort those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. And may they know that in Christ Jesus there is an eternal life. And that this is not the life that ends and there is no more. But rather that death is simply an entry into a fuller expression of the eternal life that has already begun here in this world. In verse 30, we pray that a posterity shall still serve you. It will be recounted of you, O God, to the next generation. Dear Father, may we, even in our worship tonight, be part of that proclamation of saying to the generation that will outlive us that there is a message of good news and that you, O God, have brought it about through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there is a people yet to be born, a people who will yet live on planet Earth Verse 31, they will come and declare your righteousness to a people who will be born. That you, O oh God, have done this. That you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world to suffer, to die, but also to rise again on the third day. In order that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Dear God, in these days in which we have become perhaps all the more aware of our own mortality of our own frailty of the reality of death and the threat of it lord god may our confidence be in you and may we say with the apostle paul that when we are weak then we are strong 
When we know our feebleness and our frailty, may we know that our strength is in you. Dear God, may you be with the families, especially those who are, are quarantined in, in a very restrictive way. And perhaps where there may be difficulties in homes and where there is strife and perhaps even in some cases abuse. Lord God, we pray that you would bring about grace. And that you would bring about the effects of your gospel in our lives. And in the homes of those around us, so that your name would be glorified and people would find joy in you, the living God. O Father in heaven, hear our prayer, receive our praises, for we offer it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For our sermon tonight, we'll be turning in the scriptures to John chapter 20. This morning we were. Reminded of the beginning of that chapter, Pastor Rossi led us in the first 18 verses in which we had taken a look at the appearance of Jesus, the heavenly messengers who had something to say about it, and to see of the impact of Jesus Christ in him making himself known after his resurrection. Think about that. It was the first day of the week. Now the scripture reading that we come to tonight, beginning at verse 19, picks up from there, still the same day, later on in the day, and so as we celebrate and remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on this particular Lord's Day, it's perhaps around this time of the day that these events begin to unfold. We have the tail end of this day, but then this text goes out a week, and then also ends with a summary. Before we read from God's word, let us once more come before our God and ask for his blessing upon the reading of his word. Shall we pray once again? Father in heaven, we want to be taught by you. Open our eyes so that we might see what you have revealed to us here. May it not be the imagination of our own hearts, but rather, O oh God, may we see what you would want us to see. May we understand what you would have us to understand. And therefore, be with him who brings forth this word that he might do so clearly and also faithfully in a way that is consistent with what your word says. But also, O God, may your Holy Spirit bring these words to our heart in such a way that we see Jesus, that we see him for, for who he is, that we might bow down before him, but also rejoice in him. Lord God, may you help us. In this time together, for we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hear the reading of God's word, John chapter 20, be, 20, beginning at verse 19. Hear God's word and receive it with a believing heart. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, 
and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. There ends the reading of God's word. May the Lord add his blessing to it. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open in front of you as we give our attention to this portion of God's word. Your congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, if you were there on that night, think of this. Jesus is alive. But the, but the disciples have not yet seen him. And therefore are not yet fully convinced that he is alive. Oh, how things have changed for them so rapidly. It almost makes me think of our own lives in the cer present circumstances. How things have changed for us, haven't they? In just, in just weeks, think of how things have dramatically changed in our own lives. Children who would otherwise go off to school are now at home. College students who have otherwise been on college campuses are now at home. Dads and moms who had otherwise been out in the workforce are now at home. And as we listen to the things on the internet, on the television, as we listen to the news, I don't know about you, but I find myself tracking and I look and I watch and I say, how many new cases are there today? How many deaths are there today? And where are they? Where are the statistics? Does it show that things are getting closer to where we live? Is it in our state? Is it in our county? Is it in our neighborhood? And behind it all, don't you see, congregation, that, that there's also an element of uneasiness. You go to the grocery store and you see people with masks on. There is a level of the sense that we need to self-protect. And behind it, I suspect, in many cases, there's an element of fear. What if it comes to me? What if it comes to my household? But even beyond that, what is this going to do for the economy? How long will I have my job? Or maybe you're already laid off and you say, how am I going to survive? How am I going to pay for my groceries? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my bills? Or even the question, is there going to be groceries to be bought? All of these changes, all of a sudden. But think about it, congregation. These disciples in this room, in this particular evening, have seen dramatic changes as well. Just a week ago, the Sunday before, they saw Jesus come marching into Jerusalem, a triumphant entry, and it looked very impressive and very promising. But as the week made its way through, by Thursday night, Jesus had been arrested. By Friday morning, he was on the cross. By Friday evening, he was dead. And now they have been sitting quietly for the last couple of days, thinking, what's going to happen next? How do we move forward? We had staked everything on the fact that we thought Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, who had come according to the promises of the Old Testament. But what now? So where do we find them? We find them locked. Locked behind doors. In our, in our text, it simply says in verse 19, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut. Other translations say that the doors were locked. I think that's a legitimate way to say it. They were shut in a, in a secure way. Why? For fear of the Jews. 
congregation, I want us tonight to meet Jesus. And I want us to take us back into this text in such a way that we begin to see what the disciples saw, hear what they heard, experience what they experienced, so that we might meet the risen Lord in a way that they met Jesus and transformed their feelings and their thinking. So notice these three things tonight. First of all, let us notice that the risen Lord, Jesus, dispels, first of all, their fear. Secondly, he dispels their doubt. And finally, we notice that Jesus is life. Jesus is eternal life. First of all, then, let us notice how Jesus, the risen Lord, dispels their fear. He does it in two ways. He does it in two ways. First of all, he does it by his very presence. If you look again at verse 19. There they are behind locked doors. And then it says. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst it does not say that Jesus unlocked the door, does not say that he knocked on the door. It says that Jesus appeared in their midst, which means he came through the locked doors, as Pastor Rossi mentioned this morning. He had mentioned the stone that was rolled away from the tomb. Did you know that the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let the witnesses in? It was to allow the witness to, to, to see that Jesus was not there. But now Jesus comes through the locked doors, indicating that this Jesus is supernatural. Yes, this Jesus was the one that they had followed, but now he is standing in their midst right away. This is what we would call classic Jesus. He appears at remarkable times. Remember when all of a sudden in the midst of the storm, there they see what appears to be a ghost walking on the water. And they are afraid. And as Jesus comes closer, he says, do not fear. It is I. It is me. What does Jesus do now? He says, peace to you. So notice his presence, his presence, there he is, but he doesn't stop with that. He speaks to them, and the very first thing he says is something to calm their fears. Isn't this just wonderful about Jesus? He doesn't berate them to say, I told you this. Instead, he says, peace to you. And the term that he probably spoke to them, probably a Hebrew Aramaic term, shalom, Shalom, which doesn't simply mean peace. In other words, take it easy. No, it, the term shalom in the Hebrew mindset was all things are well. There's nothing to worry about. It's all okay. It's going to be okay. Well, are things okay? The Jews are still out there. Remember, they're afraid of the Jews. The Jews still hate Jesus. And in fact, the apostles are going to start preaching. And when you get into the book of Acts, you know that there are still Jews who are still opposed to Jesus. And they're still opposed to those who are teaching Jesus. And they imprison Peter. They imprison John. They threaten to put them to death. Notice what has changed. It's not that the Jews have changed. What has changed is Jesus is present with them. And he says, peace to you. Oh, congregation, are you afraid? Are you afraid of catching the, the virus? Are you afraid of what this is going to do, do to you economically? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't make wise decisions and seek to be wise about this. But do you see what Jesus promised to the disciples? He promises the same thing to you, Christian. When he left this world, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. You see, Jesus dispels the fear of his disciples and he dispels our fear as well. Notice what Jesus also does in verse 20. It says, now, when he had said this, he showed them his hands. And his side. 
He probably was wearing somewhat of a robe, and he held his hands out, maybe pulled the robe back so that they could see where the spike had pierced his hand. Very likely, he pulled his robe back so that they could see his side, and they saw the scar. You see what this did for the disciples? Two things, two conclusions. Conclusion number one, this is Jesus. This is the very one that we had seen hanging on the cross. This is the very one that was brought down. This is the very one that had spikes driven through his hands. This is the very one who had the the soldier pierce his side. The blood and the water flowed down. They had seen it. They had heard of it. They knew that that was the Jesus that had been buried in the tomb. But now this is the same Jesus. The second conclusion is this is that this Jesus is indeed alive. It is the same Jesus, and he is not dead, but he is alive. You see how this affects the disciples? They were afraid, but look at verse 20. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Notice, the circumstances did not change. The Jews are still out there. There are still Jews that hate Jesus, and there are still those who want to kill those who embrace that. They will encounter that. Congregation, our gladness does not depend on our circumstances. We're tempted to say, I can finally be relieved if only they finally come up with a remedy for the virus. I will, st- I, will, I will breathe a sigh of relief when the economy gets going again. Notice, Jesus doesn't say you can breathe a sigh of relief when the Jews finally stop their persecution of the church. No, Jesus is there. And already the disciples are glad. You see what that means for us? The remedy. The remedy for our anxiety is to look for Jesus. And you will find him in the pages of Scripture. I encourage you. I encourage you to look for Jesus in the pages of Scripture. He is the one who dispels our fear by his presence. And he is indeed closer than you perhaps know. And you will recognize and realize that closeness as you begin in the Scripture. But there's a second way in which Jesus dispels fear, and that is with his purpose. Well, what is his purpose? If you look at verse 21, it says, Then Jesus said to them, again, peace to you. In other words, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Think of this. Jesus was dead, and before he was dead, his disciples knew exactly what they needed to do. They followed him. They walked after him. Where he led, they followed, and they had a sense of what they needed to do. But now, they've been thinking, what do we do next? Well, Jesus is now alive, and what's going to happen? Well, their minds have probably not gone to that yet. But perhaps if they did, maybe they would think maybe life can continue as it was before. We'll simply follow Jesus. He was dead. Now he's alive. We'll follow him again. No notice. Jesus spells out. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what's going to be new. As the father has sent me, I also send you. Jesus is introducing a transition. There is a change. We're not going back to the way that it was. There is going to be a new normal. And that new normal is, I trained you for three years, showing you how to follow the Heavenly Father. And as the Father sent me to train you, but also to die and rise again, so now I send you into the world. This is a very prominent theme. We don't have time to go into all the scriptures, but I challenge you. Here's a very interesting study. Take out your concordance and look for all the words send or sent in the gospel of John. And you will find a number of times where Jesus makes it very clear that he was sent by the father and that he was sending his disciples. Let me give you just a quick sample. Turn back to John chapter 17. 
John chapter 17, beginning at verse 3. This is his high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying to his father. And in verse 3, he says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There it is. Then drop down to verse 18. He's continuing to pray, and he says to his father, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Probably a reference to an earlier time where he sent them out two by two. He sent them out casting out demons. He sent them out doing miracles. Then if you drop down also to verse 23. He says, I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me. Verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Me, the disciples were fully convinced that Jesus was sent of God. And so he says to them, just as the father sent me, now I am going to send you. Now, that's stating it generally. Then he goes on to something a bit more specific. He's sending them in an official capacity for a specific task. And what is it? He goes on to say, turning back to John chapter 20 at verse 21. Actually, verse 23, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And this verse in itself really requires a full sermon uh, connecting it to what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, as well as Matthew, excuse me, chapter 16, verse 19, as well as Matthew 18, verse 18. But let me just summarize it this way. What Jesus was saying is that based on the word of God, you will be able to assure people who believe in Jesus that their sins are forgiven. And to those who are living unrepentant lives, you will say to them that as long as you remain in your sin, you are not forgiven because that's what the Bible says. Let me give you just one illustration of Jesus doing that. Turn turn back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 where... You have those who came against Jesus because he had healed a man who had been blind from birth. And then at the end of John chapter 9, those who would not believe in Jesus and those who continued to be cantankerous with them, this is what Jesus said in verse 40, John 9 verse 40. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. You see, Jesus did not forgive the Pharisees because they were bold in their sin, in their denial of Jesus, in their refusal to embrace Jesus. So let me say this to you who are listening here tonight. Are you persisting in your sin? Deliberately, carelessly, recklessly? I can say to you on the authority of God's word that as long as you continue in unrepentant persistence of sin, you do not belong in the kingdom of God. A sober statement. But that's what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples, you will declare to those who are in continuing sin, they are not forgiven. But let me say to you, Christian, let me say to you, sinner, who has a, a sensitive conscience, let me say to you tonight that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, though you doubt yourself, though you doubt The sincerity of your faith, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, I can say to you that in Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Don't doubt it. 
That leads us really to the second thing tonight. Jesus not only dispels fear by his presence and by his purpose, but he also dispels doubt. Look at how he deals with Thomas. Thomas has this, uh, this approach to life, as many do today, what we call the scientific method. I only believe what I can see. But notice how Jesus dispels this doubt. In verse 24, Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them with Jesus. And so the other disciples therefore eventually said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the prints of the nails, and unless I see his side and put my hand in it, he says, I will not believe. Oh, congregation, there are many today who take the same approach. Faith is just too unbelievable. Why would I believe in a God that I cannot see? Well, let me ask you this. How many people wearing masks today? How many people quarantining themselves today? How many of them have seen the coronavirus? Only a few scientists have. And yet, you believe the word of the scientists? They saw it in the, in the laboratory, and you believe it. Congregation, I want you to understand something about faith. Faith is laying hold of something that you cannot see with your eyes, but you believe to be real and true. And when we come to the Christian faith, we also have to realize that though Thomas said, I will not believe until I see it, that does not mean that seeing is believing, but it does mean that we believe in something that is so real that it could be seen. Thomas was one of the eyewitnesses, as was Mary at the tomb this morning, as were the disciples who saw the empty tomb. What do we have here? We have eyewitnesses, not because they had to see in order to believe, but in order that we have eyewitnesses who could say, I was there. Jesus is a real person who lived at a real place at a real time. We can, we can mark the place. We can mark the calendar. And Jesus is real. Now, Thomas, Thomas lived at the level that most of us live. I will not believe it until I see it. But don't write that off. As thinking that the Christian faith is just kind of like all the other myths and all the other religions that are simply the imagination of men's minds. No, the Christian faith is historical reality. It can be based on time and people and places. It's real. Though we cannot see it, though we were not there, it is just as real as World War I was real, which perhaps most of you were not even alive. And yet you believe it happened. This is real. Objective. And so let's put away the, the, the lie of doubt that says you cannot believe it unless you can see it. And so what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus comes with what I call peaceful persuasion. Three steps here. First of all, he announces peace. Here again, they are behind locked doors. Verse 28, and after eight days, the disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. What does that tell you that the doors are shut? They're still somewhat afraid. The doors are shut and Jesus stood in the midst. There he is. He again appears and what does he do? He announces peace to you. This is now the third time that he says peace to you. He said peace to you when he first appeared uh, the first time. Then before he gave them the commissioning, he said peace to you. It's going to be all right. Why? Because you have a purpose in this world. And now he comes and he says peace to you. Why? Because he knows that Thomas in particular is still distraught about this and is unbelieving. And so the second thing that he does is he presents himself. He presents himself, his hands and his feet. He says to Thomas very clearly, Thomas, here's the nail hole. Put your finger here. He pulls back his robe and he says, Thomas, here's my side. Put your hand here. Jesus 
is giving the evidence. And I suspect that this is given to a one like Thomas because of all of us in this world today who struggle with believing what you cannot see. Here was somebody who lived. He was there and he denied it. He doubted it. But seeing was indeed believing. Is this reality? Absolutely. What do we see here, congregation? We see Jesus compassionate. He comes in the locked doors and he says, peace to you. Oh, what a compassionate Savior we have who comes so gently, so beautifully. And then he comes with his evidence so patiently. How long have you been holding out and thinking, I really doubt that this is true. Maybe you've never even voiced it before, but you kind of shy away from it and you feel a little bit embarrassed when you talk about Jesus because you wonder if people will think that you're kind of a nutcase and, and, and kind of a little bit off in left field and, and say, do you really believe that? Oh, Christian, this is something that we can embrace and Jesus comes patiently to us again and says, look at the evidence. Thomas saw it. There it is. So he announces peace. Secondly, he presents himself. And then he ends with this urgent counsel to Thomas. He says at the end of verse 27, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And this is what I would say to you if there is anyone listening tonight who has any doubt about the Christian faith. Do not be unbelieving. But I beg you, be believing. Look at the evidence. Embrace it. Do you see Jesus in his compassion? Do you see him in his patience? Do you see him in his persistence? And may you hear Jesus saying to you tonight, believe it, my friend. Believe it. Do not be unbelieving. It is real. It is something that you can stake your life on. And immediately, do you see what happens to Thomas? We call Thomas Doubting Thomas, but I think we ought to call him Confessing Thomas. Look at his confident confession. He gives a confident confession. Notice the two things that he says. He says, my Lord and my God, my Lord. In other words, you are the master. You are the one that we had followed. We are the one that you are the one to whom I ought to submit my life to. But he also says, my God, my God. In other words, I do not only see you as a man, but now I see all the more clearly that you are indeed one who is true God. Doesn't it remind you of Jesus when he met with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi? And he says to them, you know, what do people say about me? What are they saying who I really am? And. They said, well, some of you think that you're John the Baptist. Some of you think that you're Elijah. Some of them a great prophet. He says, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus, on behalf of the other disciples, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what Thomas is saying. So he says, you are my Lord, you are my God. But notice how personal it is. He uses the word my. My Lord, I will submit to you and you are my God. I will submit and give my worship to you. The very thing that Jesus had said to Mary this morning in verse 17, I am sending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And now Thomas says to Jesus, you are my God. That's what you need to believe. And this leads us then to the last thing tonight. Jesus not only dispels the fear of the disciples. He not only, not only dispels the doubt of, of Thomas and Thomas-like folk. But notice what Jesus says about himself. Jesus is life. Notice verse 30. Verse 30, in a sense, uh, is commentary. Uh, so far, we've been listening to the record of the first day and then a week later. And now there's a, a sense, a new paragraph at verse 30. And we have this comment from John inspired by the spirit who says, and truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And if you go back through the gospel of John, there are multiple places where it talks about signs 
In fact, there are seven in particular, but we can also add this one here. What is the sign of Resurrection Day? It's the sign of Jesus rising from the dead. Uh, here's the evidence. The empty tomb, the heavenly messengers, Mary who had encountered Jesus, and now these appearances of Jesus. He appeared to the disciples on the day of resurrection. He appears a week later to Thomas. But why did John write these? What was the purpose of John writing all of these things in the gospel, and especially these signs? Verse 31, he says, but these are written that you may believe. You see what we're up against? This was exactly the case with Thomas. He said, I will not believe unless I see the nail prints and put my finger in it. I will not believe unless I put my hand in the side. But also go back to verse 8 from this morning. Verse 8. Remember, Peter and John run to the tomb. John gets there first. Peter barges in. And then we read in verse 8. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first. I believe this is John talking about himself. It says, he went in also. And he saw and believed. Why did John write all that he did in the gospel? Why did he record these events? So that we would have nice Bible stories to read to our kids before tucking them into bed? He said, no, I write these things so that you might know the truth about historical realities that you were not present to, uh, to witness, but there were witnesses there, and I'm telling you about them so that you will believe. Believe what? Look again at verse 31. Two things. First of all, First of all, that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ. The term Christ means the anointed one. I like the way uh, the children's catechism puts it. What do we know about Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, the anointed? He has been anointed to be our prophet, our priest, and our king. Why do you need Jesus as a prophet? And the children's catechism says, because I'm ignorant. I don't know these things. Why did John write these things? So that we would know heavenly realities. So that we would know about Jesus Christ. I am ignorant. I need Jesus to reveal the love of God. How do we know the love of God? God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How do I know the love of God? Through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But to be anointed is not only to be anointed as the prophet but also as the priest. Why do you need a priest? I need a prophet because I'm ignorant. I need a priest because I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I am in need of forgiveness. What did Jesus commission the disciples to do? To go and forgive the sins of those who confess their sins. And to assure them that they are forgiven. I don't know about you congregation, but I need that. We had a little incident in our home in this past week. In which I said some things that should not have been said. Is at the end of the day, and I suppose I could write it off as, well, we were all tired, and I said what I shouldn't have said. We went to bed unreconciled. First thing the next morning, I, at the breakfast table, I said to my family, I said, I need to apologize to my family. I had to tell them, your dad was a bad example last night. What I said, I shouldn't have said. One of my kids had apologized, and I said, I didn't even acknowledge that. I should have forgiven you. Another one, I said, this is how I should have talked to you, but this is how I talked to you instead. I need forgiveness. And this means something to me as a Christian, that Jesus is the Christ. Not only the prophet by which I receive the truth, but he is the one who is the sacrifice who forgives my sins. Being anointed is not only... As a prophet, a priest, but also as a king. Why do I need a king? Because I am weak and helpless. That's the answer of the children's catechism. I'm weak. I need the protection of God. The protection of God from, from the devil. I need protection of God from the world that presses in upon me. I need protection of God from my own heart. What are we to do? We are to embrace Jesus as the Christ. But the second thing that he says we are to believe is this. He says, not only believe that he is the Christ, but the son of God. 
Son of God, meaning that he is, has come down from God, that he is affiliated with God, that he is equal to God. As Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And the Jehovah's Witnesses coming knocking at my door, I try to give my, my testimony to show the emphasis of Jesus. And what I say is Jesus died on the cross for my sins in order that he might remove my guilt and my shame. And he was able to do that because he was also true God. And as true God, he was able in, to endure the wrath of God against my sin. You see, congregation, why we need Jesus? We need Jesus to be the Messiah, the anointed one. We need Jesus to be true God, to Take our place. He was not a mere man. He is also true God. And isn't that exactly why he was crucified? The Jews accused him of blasphemy. He said, they, he claimed to be God himself. This is blasphemy. And if any other person would have done that, of course, that's blasphemy. But when Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is equal to God, it is not blasphemy, it is the truth. But notice what verse 31 goes on to say. It says, and that believing you may have life in his name. You see, it's not just you believe Jesus and believe these two things about Jesus and then Jesus gives you life. I want you to see that life. Eternal life is a relationship. Eternal life is not, first and foremost, a long expanse of time. But eternal life is a relationship with a person. In John chapter 17, verse 3, which we read earlier. John 17, verse 3, Jesus is praying to his father and he says, And this is eternal life. That they, that is my disciples, might know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God the Father. It is to know Jesus Christ, His Son. Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Life, eternal life, is a relationship. How do you have that relationship? It's by knowing who Jesus is. By embracing Him. Embracing him as your prophet, as your priest, as your king. Your prophet who makes things known to you about God. The priest who has died for you. The king who protects you. But also know him as God himself. So in closing, congregation, let me challenge you in three ways. Number one, let me challenge you to develop the habit of noticing Jesus and his presence as you read your Bible. Ask yourself as you read, especially through the Gospels, ask yourself, how does Jesus' personality shine through his works? How does his character shine through his actions? And then pay attention to the detail. A second challenge is this. Get to know Jesus personally. You see, that's when the fears were driven away. That's when the doubt was driven away. So what do you do? Don't aim at getting rid of doubt and fear, but aim at looking at Jesus. Get to know Jesus personally. Go back and reread his dealings with Thomas. Pay attention to his demeanor. What does he say? How does he handle Thomas? What doesn't he say? He doesn't say to Thomas, oh, come on, get with it. No, he deals with him patiently, but also persistently and compassionately. But then ask yourself, how would have you handled this much differently? My last challenge to you is this. What stands out in your mind when you think of eternal life? Is it a person? Or do you tend to think of it as a place, such as heaven? Or a long span of time, such as time that goes on and on and on and never ends? Do you think of eternal life first and foremost as a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Well, how must you change your own thinking to align it with Scripture? Jesus Christ is alive. And I hope in these verses tonight you have met the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord, 
And as you get to know him, may you find that he and focus on him drives away your fears, drives away your doubts. And may you find that you are in love with Jesus. Not the idea of eternal life, not some afterlife, but Jesus himself. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus. And though we cannot see Jesus with our eyes, though we cannot hear the cadence of his voice, though we cannot touch him and put our fingers into the nail prints in his hands, may we know that he is indeed real. That there was a time that he lived on planet earth that there was a real cross on which he was crucified, that there was a real tomb in which he was buried, and that there was a particular day on the calendar that he rose again from the dead and that he was seen by Mary, that he was seen by his disciples, that he was seen by Thomas, who did not believe until he did see. Oh, Lord God, you had said to Thomas that he had believed when he saw but blessed are those who will see, who will believe without seeing. Oh, Lord God, may you give us that faith to believe Jesus without seeing him physically. But may we see him by faith as we read the pages of Scripture. Amen.